tardes a todos. Estamos de nuevo en, una, en un lunes de seminario. En este caso, en esta ocasión, o, eh, sería dentro del programa que hemos llamado Seminar Lectures. Y hoy hemos invitado a una persona que espero que los meses corran y que la tengamos ya eh, entre nosotros. Y esta persona es Natalia Díaz Rodríguez. Natalia comenzó su, pues, su andadura investigadora aquí en la Universidad de Granada, pero como veremos en su presentación, pues su vida científica es pues, una vida científica como la que se espera hoy que tengan los, los investigadores jóvenes, que es una vida en la que se no solamente esté en, su, en el centro donde ha estudiado, sino que tenga una cierta trayectoria en diversos sitios donde seguramente en cada uno de ellos pues, guarda un magnífico recuerdo y donde ha tenido grandes lecciones. Y espero que cuando Natalia esté con nosotros, como Juan de la Cierva Incorporación, pues nos enseña un poquito de cada lugar en el que ha estado. Y hoy, pues Natalia nos va a hablar sobre inteligencia artificial aplicable, ese tema que lleva unos años ahí como naciendo, pero que ya ha explotado y ya, como estaba comentando Paco, eh, pues lo tenemos que tener en cuenta en todo nuestro desarrollo. Incluso se, se considera en las distintas estrategias nacionales de IA, eh, la Carta de Derechos Digitales, eh, de, que se está ahora elaborando pa, eh, en España. Y creo que es un tema muy interesante y como es tan interesante espero que esta vez el moderador no tenga que hacer ninguna pregunta porque, y que solamente tenga que cortar eh, de todas las preguntas que, que haya. Pues Natalia, no me enrollo más y te dejo pues, ante, ante todo, cuando tú quieras. Vale, muchas gracias Eugenio por la presentación, muchas gracias por invitarme a dar una charla. Eh, procedemos a hacerla en inglés porque de hecho me es más fácil ya que siempre la, la terminología ayuda pero vaya que luego podéis hacer preguntas en español o, o como queráis vale bueno pues eh, welcome everyone uh, I'm Natalia Díaz Rodríguez I am uh, assistant professor in INSTA is part now of Institut Politécnico of Paris and also part of the India Flowers team and I'm mainly going to talk about Uh, work that has been uh, involving 12 partners distributed among different institutions, including France and Spain, and many collaborators, which are acknowledged here, and, and many among the public as well. So there was a, a talk uh, in, in recent uh, weeks about uh, fairness, and there are some concepts uh, overlap in this talk, but we will focus on explainable AI and how we can um, reach responsible AI thanks to, to these principles. And uh, just to, to give you a, a little overview of uh, my background, if you don't know me, uh, this is just to, to show in, in a picture that shows better than words. So they, they, Institutions are being uh, affiliated or receive funding from, and uh, in the in the square you can see the most recent ones from from this summer also. Uh, I'm also co-founder and um, board member of Continual AI, which is a, a non-profit organization where we have open materials, open forums for uh, deep learning enthusiasts, and uh, basically uh, Deep learning that allows to learn from uh, uh, like in life, uh, since we are kids, it's inspired by how kids learn. And uh, the focus is on avoiding catastrophic forgetting, which happens in neural networks, as you know. Um, my, a, a bit about my lab, uh, rapidly. So my lab is called Inria Flowers. There are many Inria in France. In France. Uh, one of them is flowers, is uh, co-located with Bordeaux. And uh, why flowers? It's, uh, it means it's a uh, flowing epigenetic robotic systems. That's the acronym. And we inspire AI models from animal cognitive development, for instance, using artificial curiosity or active learning or intrinsic motivation. And we also use cognitive science, developmental psychology, et cetera, to elaborate computer and robotic models and uh, as tools to understand more uh, developmental processes in humans. For instance, we study the role of embodiment, how a robot cannot just be an algorithm, a brain, but also the role of uh, the body, uh, the arms, the legs, uh, when, when the robot is learning, and also the role of social learning. Excuse me, Natalia. Uh, is yes. it possible 
uh, to to make a, a larger the presentation because I don't know if there is some. Okay. Uh, is this better? Yes, I guess it is. Yes. Okay, it because is. I minimize, uh, hoping that you wouldn't okay. notice. But <laughs> thanks for telling. Thanks. Okay, it's better, no? Okay, okay, good. Um, yeah, because I, I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, okay, so in this talk, uh, I will review concepts related to explainability of uh, AI methods. I we, we did in this article, which is uh, being very successful, um, the um, uh, a, a literature review on many approaches, and this keep growing every day. Every day we get uh, citations, and more and more papers are uh, doing explainable AI. And this is because uh, there is plenty of work to do, actually. And um, we analyze uh, the state of the art, but we also propose some taxonomies that allow you, uh, from an outsider point of view, get fast into the field and know what uh, has been done and what is left to do. And then we promote re uh, responsible AI as a final motto, which we present as a concept, promoting explainable AI for AI in, in practical settings. So why is explainability pursued? So there are different purposes of, of why explainability is sought by different audience profiles. So users of the model vary from regulatory, regulatory entities, agencies, or data scientists and managers. And the reasons to demand explainable models lie on roles of verifying fair decisions for users, certifying model compliance with legislation, audits, ensuring new functionality or simply understanding as domain experts. So we have mapped all users um, uh, explainable AI goals to, to summarize them in trustworthiness, causality, transferability, informativeness, confidence, fairness, accessibility, interactivity, and privacy awareness. If we consider the classical definition of explainable AI of without the at all, uh, that you can see here, we thought that a relevant dimension is missing in order to properly evaluate explainability. So we say that um, given an audience, uh, this was our main contribution to place the audience as a key aspect to be considered when explaining a model. So given an audience, an explainable AI is one that produces details or reasons to make its functioning clear or easy to understand. Now, um, we will use a model as the target of the explainability considered here in order to illustrate different levels of transparency. We could also use an example, an output class, or a data set, okay? but here we will use a model. So there are three main levels of transparency. Uh, simulatability is the ability to simulate the model. This should be strictly by a human. Uh, we also have the decomposability. Uh, which is the ability to explain each input, each, each parameter, each calculation without additional tools. And then we have algorithmic transparency where we can define it as the ability to understand the process to produce any output where the model has to be fully explorable by mathematical analysis and methods. You can compare a linear model error surface that can be understood and reasoned about with a deep arch architecture loss landscape that we cannot even fully observe, okay? This, this would mean the algorithmic transparency. Now, uh, here is the proposed uh, explainable AI taxonomy of the review literature and trends uh, identified for explainability uh, related to different machine learning models. In this uh, taxonomy is a bit small, but you can just check the article. The, the colors represent the type of input data. So they are mostly applied in tabular data, text, or image, depending on the color. Um, if we zoom in, we can see a clear distinction among models that are interpretable by design, here called transparent, and those that can be explained by means of external explainable AI techniques of, or post hoc techniques, because they are not really readily interpretable by design, right? So post hoc models can be model agnostic or model specific, and model agnostic resort to different uh, means to enhance the interpretability, such as explanation by simplification, feature relevance, local explanation, visual explanation, etc. 
In model specific post hoc explainable AI method, we can find techniques that are, of course, um, adapted to that particular method, like ensembles, SBMs, multi layer neural networks, RNNs, CNNs, etc. So, starting from one o'clock and going clockwise, here we can see different um, post hoc approaches. For instance, the local explanations, they segment the solution space to give explanation to a less, less complex solution subspace. Um, in that way, they explain only part of the model, as the name says. We also have feature relevance that um, quantify the affection or sensitivity of, uh, of a feature upon the output. We can continue with the explanation by example, which uh, consists of extracting representative examples that grasp the, some inner relations and correlations found by the model. We also have text explanation that performs some kind of semantic mapping to some kind of symbols, in this case, text. We also have model simplification, which is a whole new system is rebuilt based on the trained model in order to maximize the resemblance to the original model and reduce the complexity of the original one. And finally, we have uh, visual explanations, which, um, which try to visualize the behavior and the complex rules or interactions in the model. Um, here, I, I leave you some names that uh, if you're interested to, to check more of these methods, for instance, uh, model agnostic techniques. Here is illustrated SHAP, SHAPLAY, uh, additive explanations, which is very trendy and very much used. We will see an application later, but there are many other counterfactual examples, sensitivity analysis, etc. We also have um, among the model agnostic techniques and visual explanation techniques like uh, sensitivity analysis, individual conditional expectations that redefine partial dependency plots, etc. Uh, we would not go so much into details. I prefer more to discuss with you some other applications. We also have by simplification, uh, feature relevance. Uh, there is also newer methods that extend the previous one to warranty some theoretically correct explanations like pattern net, pattern attribution. And here are some examples, for instance, of uh, explainability in deep learning. This is the one that we are more, most interested, right? Because models that are in, inherently transparent, they, they don't have as much need for explainability. But here we show that uh, techniques that on images Mm, the attribution methods such as heat maps, saliency maps, or class activation methods. Uh, they show what is the contribution to the prediction of each single pixel and, and what part of the example is responsible for the network activating in a particular way. And the class activation methods like the GradCam, uh, they answer the question of what regions are important for predicting this particular concept, for instance. Now we have we saw that uh, attribution studies uh, what part of an example is responsible for the network activating a particular way, right? While here we have other example that shows uh, feature visualizations that answer questions about what a network or a part of a network is looking for. We do this by generating examples for the part of the network that we are interested in. Here we could generate an example for a neuron. What is this neuron? Uh, searching for, for a channel or for a layer. And this is possible because we can differentiate with respect to the, to the input. Now, uh, we can also have explanation by simplification. Here we see an original image. Uh, we see what parts of the image explain the part of electric guitar when we caption the image or uh, the part that actually responds to acoustic guitar. So how does the prediction changes when we perturb the input here? The perturbation is through a mask. And we see methods that make use of this idea, like Lime, a very popular one, but there are many others also. They still and compare where they compress different models to, to audit uh, black boxes. Now, uh, we saw, uh, I don't know if you have seen, but uh, there are many class activation methods and saliency methods, but people are not uh, um, so happy about it. Let's say they are receive, they're starting to receive a lot of criticism, mm, like they are not a full explanation or they are sensitive to variations. So another way to produce 
quasi textual explanations is through image captions. Image captioning is the process of describing what is it in an image. And here we can see that there are a lot of bias in these models. For instance, this guy in the beach is saying the algorithm that a man is standing on the beach holding a surfboard. It means that he's seeing many people in surfboard with the beach, but in this case, there is no surfboard. And um, there is also saying the Berkeley deep driving data set is saying a car is stopped at a zebra cross because a traffic light is red and I cannot see any red traffic light. So this process is actually showing the bias that the image captioning models are suffering. And this is, is to the point of suffering object hallucination. <laughs> this is effect, it's uh, funny, but it, it basically consists of talking about objects that don't exist. And this is uh, due to bias in the training data set. So one metric that we designed to highlight this problem uh, is the semantic fidelity metric, which uh, aimed at capturing this phenomenon of object hallucination. And we use the embedding similarity metric uh, and a ratio to measure the alignment among the, the nouns in the cap caption, the, uh, let's say the, the objects mentioned in the text describing the image and the actual objects present in the image. Uh, and we presented with a real life ego vision life login data set, which actually it's from my life when I lived in Netherlands. <laughs> and this is one picture. And you can see there are some uh, captions, they don't make any sense. It's just doing some correlations and labeling some objects for things are, are, that are not there. So this means there are a lot of work to do in terms of uh, transfer learning. And if you just take a pre-trained model on ImageNet or on a lab data set that is perfect and you apply to your own images in real settings with little light like here or in movement like biking, there will be a lot of errors. And uh, this metric aims at capturing a bit this behavior. Uh, okay, so if we continue with the explanation methods, we have seen those that are more tackling black boxes, others that are more transparent by design. There is also hybrid models that actually merge the two. So one black box can be explained by associating it to a more interpretable model, such as a decision tree, a fuzzy rule-based system. These methods mirror or mimic the behavior of the black box model, attempt, attempting to replicate the, the input and output. However, they need to be taken with precaution because of course it's a whole new system. They might not be as accurate or as robust as the initial one, right? The second issue with these problems is the, uh, that we can have is associating uh, when we associate a transparent model or a knowledge base with the black box, the importance of the knowledge base uh, provenance is very important. Uh, so in this table, we can see that in order to truly explain the decision of a model outcome, the information about the knowledge base that we use to express the why a certain output is of, of this way, uh, can be from an external source like Wikipedia, DBpedia, Freebase, and this can result in an explanation that the user wants to hear. However, this might not be very faithful or representative of the actual reality because the model might have seen things that are not in Wikipedia or the external knowledge base. So um, for, for the output to be faithful, it, this knowledge of this knowledge base that should reflect the knowledge of the network should come from the actual data set, the data that has been seen by the during training. So this is what we argue. And this way we will highlight the reasoning mistakes and we will actually explain the black box, right? So in these lines of work, we propose uh, to enrich the knowledge base. Um, uh, let's say let, we want to kind of augment the knowledge of the deep neural network with a knowledge base that is kind of parallel or a mirror of it. And that can be used in order to express why do you think in this image there is a man? Uh, so we extend the work of Durang et al. and Barnes et al. Uh, where they look only at bias prone terms, like if it's a woman behind a computer sitting working because for instance in this picture uh, the model said a woman a man behind a computer working where, while it was a man a woman but the the model hadn't seen a lot of women behind the computer so we extend this model and we 
uh, extend this confidence and confusion losses in order to uh, constrain uh, the, the black box in such a neural symbolic model. Um, okay, so the, in this way, what we do is like, hey, so in the picture here, uh, it will say a man sitting on a bench. In the upper picture, uh, we force the network to, to be confident and say, hey, this is a person, sure, but is it a teenager? Is it a boy? Is it a senior? Or is it a, a, an elder? Uh, so in the first picture, it will say, I know that uh, there is a person in the bench, and I succeed to determine that this person type, I'm confident it's a man. But in the second picture um, down there, Actually, it, it will tell you that um, I'm sure that it's a person, but I, I am not actually sure. I'm not confident enough that it's a man. It could be a woman since it's from the behind and it's not maybe sure about the age of the person, right? So this is the idea, extending it for any, we generalize this term for any subclass that can be kind of ontologically related, a subclass, a hierarchy that uh, we, we have for a person, all the types of person, including not only the gender, but also other specification. So on the left, we presented um, an alternative taxonomy. Uh, if uh, I presented you earlier, the one for general machine learning models. And now here we map it to another that is more specific to deep learning. Uh, and this discriminates also between post hoc and inherently transparent. And we, you can see the mapping with the explainable AI taxonomy in machine learning. I leave it here for your reference. And now I want to talk a bit more about the challenges and opportunities for responsible AI. So as you know, there are, every country is uh, working on AI principle for responsible AI. Uh, AI ethics is the brand that uh, Europe wants to sell. It's not maybe the the focus of China or US, but that's something we should um, show off and we should work for it. So these principles consider GDPR, which is a right for EU citizens. But however, this principle of data protection can be also a challenge for explainable AI to thrive. And because the difficulties on privacy might obfuscate and also facilitate the traceability of uh, of models, for instance. And this is also why articles like the one we see here, that um, the right to the explanation of uh, automated decision-making system might not exist yet. And there is reasons because also not every model is explainable so far. So that's why we need to keep working so that uh, law can account for these models. And this includes from counterfactual fairness and mapping down the sources of bias to, to all, all different guidelines that uh, I'm sure you have heard about. There is also other challenges for uh, achieving uh, explainability. So data fusion, privacy, and the model explainability have not been all analyzed together, and they require some further study. So at the data level, so how is the data source uh, fused when they come from different sources? For instance, in the installation, it's kind of hard to prove what knowledge has been infused or where it comes from. Um, this, this might be your objective, but it might be also the objective not to find out for privacy purposes, right? So there are conflicting objectives. There can be also model level fusion, like in continual learning, when you learn one task, you learn your robot, you teach your robot to, to play football, then to play basket. In seven years, it doesn't play, doesn't bike, but then you should remember to bike. So this is a model level fusion of information. We also have a knowledge level fusion uh, when we perform transfer learning from one task to another, and we only care about the final task. Uh, so there are many challenges. We also have in big data uh, paradigms, the fusion of data. We have in federated learning, where it's a privacy preserving paradigm that uh, at the same time could compromise explainability because other data could be kind of filtered if only your uh, computation is done in your phone. You might think, okay, it's federated learning, only my data is here, sent here. 
compute here and the weights are shared with the central node, but there might be other acceleration data or transport data, other sensor data from your actual phone that goes together or that it doesn't go together, but it can be correlated with your actual data that you are sharing and then it was not supposed to be shared and it can be inferred. So this can, this can be can be also a source of problems. Uh, in multi-view learning is also another paradigm where we have different views of different uh, or different sources of information of the same um, object and uh, it can improve generalization. So the challenge is that all these single views models should be fused and this can also compromise explainability or sharing information that should not be shared. So in order to thrive um, in explainable AI and make it as a vehicle to reach responsible AI, all these principles and EU ethic guidelines for trustworthy AI were designed to uh, to work in this uh, line uh, from accountability, from the FAT paradigm and fate, including the ethics. You can see here the common, uh, there is the common trend of the trade-off between the model accuracy, the more accuracy uh, normally involves less interpretability, but we are here to fight that we want to achieve still the best of both worlds. And uh, this is where a lot of work remains to, to be done. Mm, there are other principles that, um, apart from this, that we should consider in adversarial machine learning, we should consider the model confidentiality. If it's a model uh, using uh, delicate data, it has been shown, for instance, this is very interesting that uh, um, sometimes, for instance, uh, removing a sensitive feature such as gender does not eliminate bias. This was more better explained by other talk, but uh, another interesting thing is that uh, even if a model explainable AI can contribute to audits or for instance explaining a model to different regulatory profiles, it has been shown that if you get an API with only inputs and outputs of a model, uh, a deep learning model, you can actually predict only with these pairs of input and outputs every single hyperparameter value used for training allowing for potential privacy related consequences. Now there has been shown that many models also can leak the data they were trained, um, trained with, for instance, Google language models, um, and also predicting the full model, even if the learning rate you are using just by using an API that you give a lot of input outputs from there. So it's quite amazing uh, the level at, at which we are reaching. And um, so it's a double, uh, a double weapon, let's say, in this case, the deep learning. Uh, we also have uh, guidelines for ensuring interpretable models. So in your organization, in your institution, you can not only look for explainability post hoc, but you can also account for contextual factors and prefer always interpretable techniques over opaque. There are some general guidelines um, where we need to also rethink them beforehand and involving the audience as, uh, as the expertise so that we can share some common vocabulary on which understand each other before we reach to the disaster. Um, in terms of the organization, uh, there are some ingredients like setting values. There are some questionnaires, there are concepts uh, um, instead of building from explainability a posteriori, you can do um, the responsibility explanation. So the, a governance model assigning accountability for each failure of your model or questionnaires that force you to think ahead and detect and desire potential impact of your, of your model. Uh, there is also, as you saw, many challenges uh, discussed here and the principles for explaining volley AI. Um, there are a lot of goodness checklists, like things that are good to have or useful for the satisfaction of the explanation, for improvement of the mental model, uh, the psychology of the explanation, the impact of the explanations on the performance, the explainer fidelity. And for instance, one that I like very much here is the data-driven um, 
th theory guided data science, sorry, uh, which is theory driven paradigm in which we use another scientific model in order to um, base our explanations or in a way to debug our model. So in general, even though this might seem very philosophical and you might find many papers that go to the philosophical field, there are still a lot of need for metrics and um, accounting for particular uh, audiences and um, survey-free programmatic metrics that we can use for validating our models. Um, this is for now the end, but I think I would like to show you now some uh, models that uh, I've been working on in along these lines. Um, so, for instance, what are concrete ways to actually validate a model through explainability? So, what I've been interested in most recently is basically ways of informing the model, influencing the model, constraining the model or enhancing the model. Let's say that enforcing the, informing the model can be with this physics informed uh, model, for instance, I'm gonna show you an example, or when, when we have uh, in COVID diagnosis involving the medical uh, radiologist, the medical expert. Um, influencing the model can be using this domain expert in the loop, adding certain domain knowledge that can influence the the knowledge base or the no, in form of a knowledge graph, for instance. Constraining it means optimizing for both, both in performance and interpretability. And then we can also enhance it with many other ways, for instance, like giving a more uh, accurate, um, let's say, a score on how uncertain they are. In terms of constraining the model, we are working on. Uh, trying to get best of both worlds with the teacher that uh, teacher model that is transparent and teaches to the black box model, which is the student. And the student learns in theory what the theoretical model says, which is transparent, but at the same time also optimizes for being performant like a black box is. So far we, uh, the idea is that to not waste, lose a lot of uh, performance, of course, or and, and our preliminary results. Um, here is a bit the idea. I, I will not uh, go much into detail. We are still working on it. But if any in the audience, anyone in the audience is working on this, maybe we can discuss more. Because for the moment, it shows to work very well. But we need more experiments because it's not always so. Um, the distillation process, let's say, is not so well understood. For now, we achieve better accuracy, slightly, not so much, as you can see, than without distillation. But we need to actually prove that this knowledge comes from the teacher and uh, not from some other, because this representation line could be mapped to different, uh, let's say, landscapes in learning. And we need to show better that this is stable and reproducible when we explain uh, an object in terms of its parts. Uh, the same problem I will explain soon uh, with part-based classifiers in, in few seconds. So another way of um, involving the expert in the loop is using science-informed learning. So here we have this example where NASA and SETI Institute this summer, we work on informing. Um, we want to make climate change more actionable and make people more aware of the current problems. And uh, so let's say we have a lot of satellite images, which we have, which we have from a lot of disaster. We have the pre-flood and then there is a hurricane um tsunami and we know how the image which um, will result of the same, the same area after the flood so here you can see the app that we developed so during training uh, we give the pre-flood image and the segmentation mask of where there is water and where there is not and um, because we know how it's going to look after the flood and then we can generate the post flow. This way we can show, hey, your tomato cultivation, uh, it's maybe not a good area to put it near this area, or you should keep maybe these walls or these wetlands or these dikes 
are better to, to build in this area or this other. This was the main idea of this work. During inference, we can say, hey, now we don't have the post-flood image because Granada has never been uh, flooded as much as, uh, as in the same dimensions as, for instance, in uh, Miami, let's say, or in uh, other areas of higher risk. But however, we have a slush output, which is um, a storm uh, uh, surge model. So, a lot of uh, earth scientists and geological scientists have worked on predicting the elevation of the water given the many, many variables. So we can use this model, even though it's lower resolution than the segmentation from an algorithm, at least we can still um, predict very good looking and very realistic. And we can say it's sign, um, physics in form because it's accounting for that or can generate that model. Um, so yeah, some people didn't like this work because they believe that uh, you can um, you cannot make decisions that affect people for disaster relief with images that are fake. So this touched my heart very much and I was very <laughs> sad that I worked so hard with this work because you know how hard are guns to train and uh, then they tell you this. So, but it made me very thoughtful. And um, of course, we don't want to use uh, human lives with fake images. We just want to help informing decisions, right? For decision makers. So we should be telling better these disclaimers. These are the limits of my, my model. My model was designed with this audience in mind. And uh, it has these guarantees. It worked well in these conditions, but maybe not in this other. So we should be very clear about what the capabilities of our model, right? So we learned something. And now uh, another way of involving humans to make your model more explainable is penalizing the model for not mimicking the reasons that an expert will use an explanation. In this context, we extended the work of Monumai that you heard about a few weeks ago. Uh, in this way, we uh, provide an architecture that uh, leverages a knowledge graph, which is a way of uh, saying an expert, which in this case are not physicists, but are art historians to tell us that, okay, this facade that we take a picture is Muslim, uh, Muslim style, because it has this Arabic arc or this column of this type or, or this window of this type. Okay, so this is the architecture. Uh, where we first detect the key elements, uh, architectonical elements, and then we apply classification. And this, you see an, an example of uh, the application that you know if you saw Alberto's talk recently. What we propose is an architecture that once we have trained the model, we apply SHAP, which is Chaplet uh, analysis. And we ask the model, what are the actual elements that you are looking for in order to tell me that this style is Hispanic Muslim? So it will tell me, it should tell me these ones, right? On the left, love arc, horseshoe arc, flat arc. However, it might be telling me others that are not actually what um, the art historians consider is typical from this. So those uh, elements that the network is actually uh, deeming important to make the decision, it's giving attribution to this feature, they will be penalized and then we will correct the model in uh, back propagation. We call this SHAP based back propagation. We are uh, submitting this um, work in a few days and it will be soon in archive. Uh, I'm happy to share if, if you if you need more information. So this is the, the how the knowledge graph looks like for each class, the attributes that uh, we have simplified a bit, uh, the ones that we are using that the expert considers that are typical, right? So how to integrate this knowledge graph? Uh, first, as I said, we look at what attributes, uh, what um, architectural elements are used to classify a given image. And SHAP tells us here, each feature on the horizontal row represents um, a global summary of the distribution of feature importance over the validation set. 
So the features with asterisk actually represent the ground truth, which is like the theoretical attribution graph, like what we would want the network to tell us why is looking is this class, why is it from this style. Uh, this represents the node in the knowledge graph given by the art historian. Okay. In this way, we can see all the pink uh, points are examples for for this class that are uh, have positive impact. So you can see that for the Muslim style here, the love arc and horseshoe arc are working fine because they are the ground truth. Also, the flat arch has a star, and we also see positive red points that contribute to the to predicting this class. So this is working fine. Now, how do we evaluate explainability? We also propose a metric, which is based on the graph edit distance among the sharp attribution graph, which is on the left, which is given an image, what, what attributes, what architectural elements the, the network used to make the decision. Uh, we see this in with letter. And then we compare this, we expand this graph with the knowledge graph that is theoretically correct. And um, the difference in edges and in um, basically the difference in wrong edges is what the edit distance give us. It's just a simple uh, uh, metric. Tell us how far is our decision from that theoretical one from the art historia. And this we use to just report how explainable our model is. Uh, if we compare uh, the detection accuracy uh, and explainability or interpretability of the model, we, we can see in two data sets, we use, we use monomifers and then Pascal part, which is also classification from images using the parts of the objects. We, we can see that the better classification performance, the more explainable the model becomes. So the lower graph edit distance. This shows somehow that learning this intermediate representation of the parts of the object actually helps simplifying the problem. It's like we humans, we don't look at every possible pixel and classify, right? You just tell me if, if, if it has four legs and one tail and two ears, it's, and it's in my home, probably it's a cat or a dog, right? So it resembles a bit more the, the way of thinking of the expert. Okay, and uh, finally, I'm sorry, sorry, I, I don't know if I'm still good on time. Just, I have a few more slides on a few uh, examples that we have also applied on explainable AI for cultural heritage. So we thought that um, if we make our model explainable for those minorities that have uh, disabilities, perhaps we are making our model actually useful because it's looking at the main dimensions that uh, perhaps are obvious to us, but uh, we are not making it explicit, right? So what we propose is including minorities like the blind people, the deaf people, as a special user and evaluator of the later explainable AI techniques or AI techniques. Basically, can an algorithm describe what is in this image or what's the style in this uh, painting of money? or et cetera. We start with art because we thought it's easy. We don't need uh, ethical approval <laughs> uh, generally. And um, we pose some challenges and some research questions that should be addressed by the latest models to, to be involved in such synergy. And we later extend it to this other uh, study where we draft the future agenda to include use cases in cultural heritage applications that involve parsity participatory design, pedagogical design, human in the loop and human robot interaction. Uh, another work that we just uh, put out is the explainability in deep reinforcement learning, where you can see that most of the projects have been looking at games, but reinforcement learning has a lot of potential using in, in health also and um, finance. Uh, we provide another small taxonomy and the methods used. And um, we are also working on, on uh, using how in cooperative games or cooperative, uh, let's say, strategies when we have different objectives, multi-objective decision, how can we explain different um, 
uh, agents, which agents are being selfish, which agents are being uh, sustainable or contributing to the common good or are just uh, causing mess, which could be useful, I think, in many applications today. Um, Okay, we also are looking at some attention mechanisms, uh, not only for um, re reinforcement learning can be applied. Like here, we show some methods looking at uh, graphs that explain the causal chains for certain behaviors happening in reinforcement learning. These are like, could we maybe use SHAP also to explain the agent contributions when, when they have different behaviors? Could we reflect um, the peaceful behavior does SHAP explain sustainable behavior? So we are also working on this. And um, also in text, we are, um, there are not so many explainable models. And there is a lot of criticism, as I said before, with attention models when applied on images. However, in text, um, there are some indications where when you have a word model, uh, a language model, sorry, you take a word and you look at the networks, it's at the other words around it that is paying attention. But if you tell me, give me a text and tell me what are the more, imp more important sentences to classify this text as, uh, let's say, racist or positive sentiment, negative sentiment, any classification task. So. We can see this model, for instance, goes into this direction. Uh, I saw it very recently. Um, it adds the human rash rationale that says, for instance, I think these two um, sentences are important and this one not. And um, yeah, so it's a way of actually, uh, it's interesting that they include the human in the loop while training, not just for evaluation, like, uh, um, like others, for instance, uh, yeah. So I wanted also to leave you here some papers that I have not studied super in depth, but I think they deserve attention. So one is attention is not explanation. And then there is the other attention is not, not explanation as an answer to the first one. As you say that, the, as you see that all these salience methods are not always so um, trustable or reproducible. And then there is also saliencies, a possible red herring when diagnosing poor generalization. And do not trust additive explanations, which uh, for instance, SHAP is one of them. So we need to study more the, the failures of this. Um, because basically this say that some adversarial distributions can yield similar performance. Uh, so that's maybe not so, uh, so acceptable if we believe that these explanations are the ones to trust blindly. Um, and this distribution can be inconsistent with the importance that they are they give to certain inputs, right, based on some gradient-based method. So this requires a bit more theoretical analysis. And we also would like to look at pro formal methods to provide guarantees that certify model in the same way that uh, Software engineering is making unit tests for programs. We should have some kind of similar um, procedure to test um, the models and uh, give some compliance, right? Uh, okay. Um, yes, I I leave you here some examples like of some artistic images. Like you can see that the caption, it's not making a lot of sense. So when you put things out of the correlation or the out of place, the models totally break. This was just uh, to show you some funny images. Um, yes, I think this is all. And uh, I leave you my contact here. I'm happy to discuss ideas for collaboration and, uh, and answer any questions. Uh, and and uh, I'm happy to, to meet you all in person very soon, hopefully. Thank you. Thank you very much, Natalia, for this uh, nice presentation. So uh, I think it's time for, for talking about the about um, your nice presentation. So all for all our the DASI people, feel free to make questions to and to open a great debate about the topic. So who is the first person that want to, to make a question?
Let's go, Paco. Um, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Um, okay, uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. This has been really, really good. I have enjoyed it a lot. And um, my question goes uh, into the type of data um, you are processing in your, um, in your um, scheme. You have talked about images, text, and tabular data. But are there any uh, models developed for video data for uh, the moment? I mean, uh, I have seen that uh, for text and images, there is a lot of models appearing every day. But are there any um, approximations to the topic using video data? Mm -hmm. OK. Did you say in captioning? or not particular task? Uh, not particularly. OK. Uh, mm, I haven't seen a lot of in video. You are right. I didn't think about it. I'm looking at too many types of data already. <laughs> so video is one of them. I have not looked at it. I need uh -huh. to solve first the uh, text and images. I'm just starting with text. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's a lot. Yeah, but. But actually, yeah, we, we, we might need it for uh, anomaly detection and all this. But yeah, I think uh, looking at the multi-view concept and uh, mm -hmm. multi-model, uh -huh. the framework of uh, privileged information that kind of merges different sources of data um, mm -hmm. can be very useful, I think, to, okay. to account for more modalities. Okay. But uh, but honestly, no, I haven't seen much in video, actually. Maybe you should be the pioneer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. No, very cool. Thank you, Paco Luque. Uh, Ivan? Hi, Natalia. Thank you very much also for the presentation. And I have a question about the segmentation part. Mm -hmm. uh, where you put, uh, can you put the... The, the opposite, yes, uh, in the um, explanation, the... no? yeah. Um, uh, where did you go? Send again, uh, be, uh, before uh, it was about the um, not monomai, the um, the flood, um, yeah, he, here, the guns, oh, okay, okay. Um, have you uh, think about um. Given, I mean, the, the main problem is that you want um, an image from a place uh, under segmentation. Uh, what does it mean? I mean, yes, yes, yes. This is a bit uh, tricky. Uh, okay, wait. This has moved. Okay, let's say, let's put it again. So the the key is uh, the main difference is during training and during inference we have different um, data because uh, at test time you don't have the, yeah, the, the actual segmentation, right? So what we do is that for training, the models we use are called uh, paired image to image translation. Mm -hmm. So you always train with a pre and post image, precondition and post condition. Uh, and then the segmentation, what we do, it's just segmenting the post flood. Even though here it might look like it's pre flood in these images, uh, the segmentation mask belongs to the post flood, if, we, if you pay attention, right? So during training, you can provide the segmentation of the post flood. So you are telling him, like, you are telling the gun, like, this is the pre flood, and this is how it's going to look. So color me all the water in a color like, in a color like uh, color, let's say. <laughs> it's like, um, which part would be floating? Exactly, like in painting, if you know the concept of in painting that you take a part of an image, remove it and let the net, as the network color it for me, what is missing. So yeah. here it's a bit similar. You are giving information of where water can be because when we didn't do that, um, the network put water in the top of a building, which makes no sense, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, so, so this is what, uh, at least this is a warranty, a way of guaranteeing that the output yeah. is physics informed. And in, during test, uh, yeah, 
because we don't have the actual segmentation of how it's going to look in the future because it can be a really yeah. great disaster. We just give the output of the physics physics model. Uh -huh. that yeah, yeah. And that's why it's so pixelated because it's not a very high resolution, but um, we do some inter interpolation and in the end it's good. Yeah, I think it's a good idea to, to use the, um, the physics for how it would, it, it would look and generate a gun to work with the, um, the physics of it. So nice. And in fact, uh, we are uh, working, we are looking now at uh, the same thing for ice, uh, melting oh. ice in the Antarctica. Uh, we have a lot of data and we are looking at the follow up work uh, with this. So, so cool. And the question, uh, it was about uh, to take this uh, experiment for other things, for example, uh, as one of my problems, uh, pulmonary disease, which uh, um, <laughs> COVID. Uh, I see how, example, uh, how to, how could we make, um, like, um, if we change the segmentation part, which is the COVID present, mm -hmm. How could it change, like as a kind of explanation? I don't know if I if I explain myself. Yes, yes. Uh, I mean, for generating this kind of change from one um, pulmonar image, chest image, mm -hmm. uh, as COVID, for example, and as an explanation, another image, uh, but um, change if if it hasn't got the pulmonary disease. Okay, I didn't think of this. This is nice idea. I like it. You know what I uh, I have students working on, inspired from this idea. I put them to put pre-COVID and post-COVID, but for that we need the same. Yeah, the same person. Patient, the same, the oof, same yeah. patient, the same uh, acquisition device. So, I think it's not working. <laughs> but uh, I mean, there we tried two models. One that you there are many models, peaks to peaks and uh, cycle. Yeah. Down. So you can have pair images and not pair images. So you can also give many people with COVID and many people without COVID and they don't need to be the picture from the same. But you know, it's less, uh, doesn't work as well. So actually that could be a nice way to well, not uh, predict or to generate data, but to maybe explain, no? Like what you're saying, I, I think, yeah. Uh, yeah, that it was almost if it could work or something. Yeah. I, I, I think it could, yes, because, um, because as long as you do the segmentation or the coloring from the same image, the, the more aligned they are, the better it works. So why not? I, I like this idea. Okay, thank you, Natalia. But Thanks. I didn't think about it for explainability, so. <laughs> thank you, yes, I will, we should talk about it. <laughs> thank you very much, Ivan, uh, for your question, for your participation, Nuria, when you want. Yes, uh, congratulations, Natalia, for your talk. And I wanted to ask you, uh, you have presented Ferrater Learning as a solution for privacy preserving. Um, at least, as far as I know, the explainability methods use that information, right? So uh, what would you do if you wanted to make a Ferrater Learning explainable? Mm -hmm. Wow, what big question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is a, to me, it's a very tricky. I don't have a real answer. Real answer. What I'm looking at um, from the ontological point of view, since my background was symbolic AI, uh, this provenance is so important. Like maybe with the ontologies, we could somehow cut where is traceable and where is not traceable and give some pre-requirement, for instance, if you are an insurance company or the person has been involved in a crime, maybe there is certain conditions under which we this privacy needs to be broken, right? Hmm. So maybe in that path, uh, we could set that path in which data, we know which data is used for training up to this point, which data is used to training up to this other time point. And then in between these two time points, we know this is forbidden to look at or to give access to anyone except uh, FBI or I don't know. But uh, how to implement it in practice? Mm, that's, uh, 
I'm not sure because yeah, I, I see like there are some conflicts. This is a real trade-off, right? Yes, I don't have any idea. Neither I was just looking <laughs> for inspiration. <laughs> yes. yes. Okay. So, mm, yeah, it's you. it's interesting because both are needed, and uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure either. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Nuria. So. There are any more? Are there any more questions? Let's go, Jose Alberto. Uh, okay, hi. Uh, first of all, thanks for the presentation. It was very interesting. And I would like to ask you about how do you feel about use leveraging semantic information from from class labels to to create uh, explainable models. I mean, uh, do you think like creating like sort of a hierarchical model, let's say in the monomai problem, uh, could help to to create um, the, the model could help the model to be more explainable? Mm, yes, definitely. I mean, what what we are presenting now is a hierarchy. It's just two levels. Like the we are trying to explain both in the distillation case and in the explanet um, explainable part based uh, classifier we classify an object and we explain it by the parts that we can detect right we think that this is i think this is the easiest way to to tackle the problem from the most simple part the challenge is that many of these um, data sets don't have parts annotated and then you cannot verify if they are actually looking at these parts or not. So this is the main challenge because in text, how do we do that? We can look at the uh, engrams or expressions, let's say, but definitely the more architectures we could have, like for instance, not syntactic level, but maybe semantic level of, uh, like you said, uh, let's say this is a, analogy or this is a saying this is a figurative sense things that are require more human intelligence that the models might not pick as much for instance for text that would be nice to have some kind of hierarchy this is uh, to tell me this text is actually scientific this other text is artistic definitely the semantic notion should help but we also want to make it not so much uh, domain specific. The architecture should be still generic enough. So, but yeah, what what level exactly were you thinking of? Maybe I can answer you better. So, um, my my problem is um, trying to to create explainable models in a multi class scenario in in general. Mm -hmm. So, so my thoughts are that. Um, creating this kind of uh, induced hierarchies can help to to create uh, more explainable models because you cannot only explain the models um, layer wise or or by by the levels of the hierarchy, but also these these models at each level should be um, simpler or, or smaller, less complex because. Uh, you are constraining the, the model, you are liberating some information, so that should help. And at the same time, it's like, um, uh, I, I believe that it, it could be more, um, it could be um, closer to, to human reasoning, mm -hmm. because we always say that decision trees are like very explainable and so on. Um, and they are like uh, they use the this structure. It's like at the end is uh, a hierarchy, or is like uh, this. This tree is like the way of representing kind of a hierarchy. Yes. So so yes, by, by using this this kind of hierarchical decompositions, we can you know we can get um, models which are more explainable, which yes, are more I, I understandable. Mm -hmm. One recommendation, I, I think you should look at compositionality is one hot concept right now. 
that basically looks at the specific models of the network specializing at particular function or role. Um, so if you look, remove some part of the, if you cut one leg to your model, <laughs> does it still uh, predict well, uh, do things they, that should be doing well with the hands? Right, so if each model part is specialized in a particular task, your model is more modular and also this compositionality emerges. So it's a common, uh, it's a concept that is being studied and maybe can help also. And then the causality and the causal explanation, uh, it's very much how we think in terms of variables and uh, signals. So if you can map your model to a causal model, with the variables that we all can understand. It's something I'm also very interested, in, but it's not always so easy when you have a, a, a very deep network. So this mapping, it's uh, still hard. I don't know, I'm happy to, to hear more if you come across something. Well, I hope I, <laughs> I will be able to do so in the near future. <laughs> Thank you very much, Natalia. You're welcome. Thank you very much, Jose Alberto. Um, is there any more questions?